I think this is the longest I've kept quiet. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, Restart India and the uh, show we've put together for you. And uh, I'm Lakshmi Praturi. Uh, and on behalf of everyone in Restart India, I thank you for joining us today. Um, so I just want to look at where are we today? You know, we are today, you know, we've had Ganesh Puja, we have Onam, and we have uh, a lot of festivity, festivities around us. And we are also going through one of the toughest times humanity uh, has faced. And uh, at the same time, it's important for us to see the positive in it. You know, Lord Ganesha is known as a remover of obstacles and Onam is uh, synonymous with ren renewal and energy. And if we put all these things together, uh, there is only one way for us to be. And that is to be with as much positivity as possible. And uh, um, the series of talks that we have put together uh, in Restart India is toward small and nano and medium enterprises because they are the uh, heart and soul of the industry across the globe, especially uh, in India. And uh, the idea here is that can we discuss what are the different obstacles being faced by them? What are the different opportunities that are there? What are the different industries, insights we can provide so we can look at what are some new business opportunities, uh, et cetera. You know, we have, for example, uh, a fruit seller, a, a vegetable seller, or uh, someone who has a little cake shop. I mean, all these small customers are, all these small businesses are, under a lot of uh, stress right now. So we, what we wanted to do is bring you some people who can give insight into what they're doing and how we can build ecosystems of small businesses around them uh, that can bring some value. Uh, you know, I love the idea of small because I believe that small is beautiful. It all starts with a small seed. When you put the seed it becomes a plant, the plant becomes a tree, and ultimately that gives us the fruits, etc. In the same way, the small and medium businesses or owners are the glue or the seed that give rise to um, many, many industries, many, many, um, you know, situations that can bear fruit, uh, that can give us sustenance, that can give us energy. So with a special homage to the small medium businesses, nano entrepreneurs, we put this uh, um, series together for you. Uh, with this, I would like to introduce you to my co-host, uh, Tina Suzanne George. Uh, she's the impact director for Restart India, uh, along with a few, in, along with her teammates. And it's that team that's bringing together all the 
uh, programs for Restart India. Uh, Tina is a next gen of the Muthut uh, leaders and she's a chartered accountant by qualification and he's worked at the likes of global accounting firms uh, before coming to um, uh, Muthut FinCorp as an associate vice president of uh, finance. And uh, the thing that's great about Tina is that she has the discipline that finance bring as well as the heart and the caring that the Muthut FinCorp group is known for. So everything that's done here is with a lot of care, a lot of support for um, what we want to be for the small and medium entrepreneurs. With that, Tina, on to you. Thanks, Lakshmi. That was very moving, <laughs> that introduction. Um, and thanks to the Inc. team for an unconditional commitment to this collaboration. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second live event series. I would like to start by just sharing how Restart India came about. Uh, when the lockdown hit, we we started reaching out to multiple small businesses just as a personal gesture to just see how they were doing, just to support them, guide them. Um, because this is a segment that we work with. Uh, our, like all our customers, they are predominantly uh, nano, micro, small businesses. And during that time, we realized that these small businesses are highly adapted to change. Uh, they're very agile. Uh, you, you give them, you just like give them an idea, they'll quickly take it on. And then, you know, they're the ones who started adapting to the new normal when we were still figuring out what that was. Um, and we realized that, you know, as an institution that's working with so many small businesses, aside from just uh, being a financial partner, where else can we uh, intervene to help them? What they need is an ecosystem that will point them in the right direction. And that's how Resar India was born. So aside from just financial services, we wanted to bring in all of these sectors um, like technology, healthcare, agriculture, marketing, because we wanted to be able to put all these minds together and be able to assist uh, this sector and answer the real questions that are faced by these small business owners. And to meet that end, we've been able to bring together a formidable mentor panel and a very talented response team from across all of these sectors. And this is just a start of uh, what Restart India is, what Restart India hopes to achieve. Um, but the vision right now is to be a one-stop advisory and guidance platform for small businesses, someone they can turn to uh, with any question that they have. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Um, you know, as you are saying that these are just baby steps, the initial steps uh, that we are taking to be able to serve uh, the, our uh, small business community, and hopefully we'll do a lot more. Uh, we have an amazing uh, mentor panel who are giving the best gift they can to us, which is their time, their expertise, their insight. So we thought that today we'll have our focus on small businesses that make up the food sector in our country. Um, and what are the challenges they're facing? What is the supply chain? What is the possibility for sustainability? And uh, what are the market fluctuations that are coming their way? In what way can we prepare uh, for the future? So uh, to enable in this conversation, we have two amazing people who are our mentors, uh, Kavita Manta and Narendra Pasuparthi. Um, so I've known both of them for a long time. Uh, Kavita is a owner and chief curator of SAGE, of SAGE Sustainable Living, a company focused on providing access to natural and sustainable lifestyles. She's had an international career, worked all over the world in different uh, functions, and now her love and her passion and her business is all focused on uh, bringing amazing food and food-related uh, um, you know, elements. And uh, Sage is, uh, um, you know, has a many in-house in product lines. Uh, they have a Sage Farm Cafe, Thrive by Sage, uh, which is in uh, uh, in Banjara Hills in Hyderabad, um, and it is one of the first farm-to-table cafes in India. 
and I have been there even before the cafe opened and I was just amazed by the variety, the tasty food that Kavita prepares with very, very healthy ingredients. Usually healthy and tasty don't go hand in hand, but not so in her case. Uh, and both the cafes specialize in uh, making all their dishes from scratch using the highest quality seasonal ingredients. Um, and also while bringing back style cooking in iron, still, uh, iron skillets. And also stay, uh, Sage Farm Cafe is located in Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad. Uh, they, they recently won the Restaurant of the Year Award, beating all hotels and cafes in Twin Cities, uh, in spite of just being a couple years old. Uh, and she was also awarded the Restaurant of the Year Award for a novel approach uh, to food. Um, and also more than half the population in India, you know, depends on agriculture for their livelihood. So what we thought is we'll have uh, Kavita speak a little bit about um, what has changed in them after the march specifically? You know, Kavita, you prepare, as I said, some of the most delicious food and you also own a farm where you grow all the vegetables, etc. So you are actually experiencing it all the way from, uh, from farm to table. So what has changed uh, since March is specifically in the farm to food supply chain. Um, do you think these changes are permanent? And welcome to the show. Thank you, Lakshmi, uh, and thank you, Tina. A really lovely initiative you both have uh, started, and they're delighted to do a uh, part in this. Um, I think um, I want to actually pick from your introduction, uh, Lakshmi. You said it's Ganesha, it's time of renewal, and uh, really, this has been a really tough time uh, across the board for many, but there are a lot of positives that have come out of it. Um, so rather than focusing on all the challenges that came, I do want to start by saying that a lot of, um, uh, Tina, you mentioned how the sector is able to adapt the quickest, but a lot of the adaption that has actually come through is a function of something fundamentally that was actually in play much before. Um, uh, obviously, the biggest issue with food is supply chain. It always has been. It's it's always been the uh, biggest challenge outside of obviously natural calamities, etc. Um, and that was dramatically interrupted during this period. Uh, but some really interesting things came out because there are so many people uh, like us who have sort of left our corporate careers and have sort of realized that the future really lies in being closer to nature, being more connected, being more sustainable. Um, and so one of the interesting things that came out was uh, even though the first uh, couple of weeks were definitely harrowing, it was very challenging to even know whether I remember I had uh, friends who were calling me and saying, hey, keep this much for me and keep this much for me. And we were desperately trying to, you know, to tell all our customers, Guy, you know, you have to ration, we can't, uh, we can't overdo it, we cannot... Uh, get you to just uh, stock up because we need to make sure everybody has access to everything and we are doing our very best to ensure that we can restock as quickly as we can. Um, but there were days with fresh produce which uh, became very, very challenging where we didn't know whether there was going to be access to villages, uh, etc. Um, but as some of the initial uh, pain points of the lockdown sort of released, a very interesting phenomena uh, occurred which was that small group of farmers were being led by some um, uh, entrepreneurial person who was able to then make connections at a community level. So suddenly you saw that while they actually managed to avoid the whole middleman perspective because the markets were not operational, that was no longer an option. And so through this necessity of the fact that this is short-term produce, you know, produce can sit for maximum three days before it goes out to the customer, uh, came the incredible opportunity of people getting together and saying, hey, if we form a quorum, uh, maybe we can actually go and fulfill one section's needs for vegetables and fruits, and uh, that will make us sustainable. And it landed up being an incredible boon for communities as well who didn't want to go out and shop, did not want to leave the security of their uh, four walls. Um, uh, so that was actually a very, very interesting phenomena that came out, Lakshmi. Um, yeah. Something that was talked about during this time was uh, supporting the farmers. Let's uh, let's actually take these group of farmers under our wing and let's say that, okay, you are our guys and you will supply to us. Um, right. And that uh, process has begun. And I do hope to a large extent that uh, a lot of it will continue post-COVID 
because it builds efficiencies at a whole lot of levels yeah. for the consumer as well as the producer yeah i mean it's great in some ways we are going back to the way it was you know the cooperatives people coming together really being there for each other and it's really great to see that uh, happening so thanks kavita for that uh, now let me introduce uh, narain uh, narendra pasupati the ceo and founder and the chief farmer of nandu's chicken uh, it's founded in 2016 uh, nandu's chicken was born with the objective to provide great quality fresh antibiotic uh, free and uh, branded chicken products to uh, customers across india uh, it's currently the only hyper local omni channel meat retail brand in india uh, the company follows an in a uh, very very interesting integrated uh, business model uh, it's not just about doing one thing but doing about very very complementary things well uh, they have about 100% not about they have 100% product uh, traceability with the promise of sp- safety and accountability and remember they uh, you know implemented all these things before covid before it was expected etc as a business practice from the word get go they were about 100% uh, traceability uh, nandu's chicken has grown and tasted success over years and also um, leads the pop, uh, poultry operations of uh, nanda group of karnataka uae and oman uh, so narain in pre covid world used to travel a lot uh, he's a passionate environmentalist uh, he's also founded another venture insectify a circular economy company which we'll find out a lot about which i don't want to say too much right now i want him to talk about it he's also an active angel investor uh, and an avid badminton player um, and also likes collecting cool cars uh, his hobbies include aero modeling biking uh, and music Uh, and uh, and i really want to say one thing about um, narendra is that uh, he's always ahead of the curve you know as i said their traceability was uh, there way before it was uh, it was necessitated and now they are looking at things like insectify that brings sustainability to farming way before anyone else uh, in, in fact in the world not just in india so he is somebody who really thinks ahead and supports you know many of ink fellows have been at the receiving end of his generosity and their family uh, philanthropy uh, so usually in our country you know many many uh, people tend to avoid meat the moment something happens so narendra i thought you should talk about and uh, um, uh, you know there is a um, health concern people start talking about uh, oh we need to know where the food is from or is meat good or not etc so has the pandemic uh, impacted the food sector dealing with meat uh, and other animal products and if so how and welcome to the show thank you lakshmi thank you for uh, such a humbling uh, introduction <laughs> it's really a pleasure to be on the show with everybody else um so with regards to um, meat uh, you know 73% of indians are non vegetarian mm-hmm. we tend to think of india as a vegetarian country actually it is not right yeah. so uh, meat has always been part of our diets and sundays are festive because of meat right uh, there's biryani being cooked at home and that's the highlight the entire family congregates at the dining table and yeah. uh, i i don't think uh, you know there's not a single housewife across the country who's not happy to receive those compliments on a sunday a lunch that she has prepared for the family so yeah. meat's always integral to our uh, you know to our presence in india right so um what uh, i mean um, beginning of covid uh, you know we heard rumblings of uh, an emerging pandemic uh, in china and uh, our experience actually we track some of these things very closely because we're in the animal uh, production industry uh, and in 2006 was the first time when we were exposed to bird flu okay it didn't jump into humans uh, it came into the birds and uh, you know these are zoonotic uh, viruses and they get transmitted by wild birds which are migrating across continents um, we had some experience dealing with that 
and uh, since then we have like a preparedness plan in place at the, in the company we monitor the notifications from oie and we saw uh, some of these being reported uh, across the planet you know the wuhan going into some sort of a lockdown etc so um, we were hoping that uh, this will again not translate back into the poor chicken right for some reason everything comes back to chickens uh, very funnily right so uh, middle of february um, you know uh, the we start uh, started seeing some videos on whatsapp university talking about uh, you know corona emerging from chicken the poor chicken had nothing to do with it in fact uh, oie and who uh, very clearly said that there's absolutely no evidence at all so for a very brief period we saw the market take a beating in fact it was such a hard time for the entire poultry industry across uh, the country because of you know irresponsible videos made and thrown up on social media uh, we estimate that our industry lost close to about 30000 crores in a span of uh, 30 days wow uh, the industry is very large it employs millions of farmers across the country and uh, almost all vegetable farmers today uh, have residual income from poultry so on the same land they grow poultry as well right it was a very large impact but uh, come towards the middle end of march the industry stepped up we did a lot of awareness campaigns um assured the customers that we didn't have nothing uh, you know the, the chicken has nothing to do with the um, you know any of the the emerging pandemic or whatever and the consumer went right back to it so um i mean lockdown was announced and uh, we saw uh, a uh, resurgence of demand and the demand was actually skyrocketing and uh, yeah it was it was about uh, clarifying connecting with the our customer base and uh, communicating with them saying that it was absolutely fine right as a matter of fact uh, i think uh, um, we have never seen meat consumption go so grow so rapidly in the last 4 months that we have seen uh, you know ever so in that sense uh india loves to eat meat and we are back in business oh um actually like this is something uh, based on kavita what you said and you know uh, narain like that was uh, i mean you shed some light on something that we didn't even know that 73% of india's population consume meat uh, and that's uh, that was a uh, eye opening um uh, kavita narain this is a question to both of you um i'm curious to understand like in the first few days of the lockdown consumers resorted to panic buying and hoarding essentials kavita you mentioned that you know they they just wanted to stock up for themselves and we know that this happened but do you feel like the behavior has changed now and it would be interesting to know from both of you like are the supply chains running smoothly now uh, especially for essential items and um just to add on like is there anything that we need to do to ensure that supply becomes more robust capital uh, first to you and then we'll hear from narain so um there was definitely a lot of panic buying um honestly a large part of it was uh, especially sort of the kind of work uh, that sage does um there is a certain uh, reputation there is a certain goodwill that we carry uh, there is a certain authenticity of produce that we uh tend to uh, have and as a result there was a, a concern that if our stocking runs low uh, people would need to go for products that they usually not used to um um having in their household so that was one of the reasons why with our customer base we did see a lot of uh, nervous buying um we kind of expected it because obviously this was scary for us too uh, because at the beginning there was no guarantee that we could even operate you know even the understanding of what essentials are and uh, uh, essentials would be allowed to operate without any um, issues there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of challenges in actually the system falling into place right at the beginning uh so yeah. we also were not entirely certain that we could assure the customer that you know what we're going to operate right through come what may we will be there we will do our best um right in the first couple of days we didn't have that uh, confidence to actually say that 
Um, but we knew very early on that we needed to make sure that people understand and we're privileged that we work with a very, um, you know, engaged and educated uh, group of uh, customers. Um, they had to understand that uh, it wasn't possible for one person to buy 50 liters of oil and keep it at home because yeah. it just was not going to uh, work. So um, we were able to tide through that first uh, week or two with uh, trying to calm people's nerves down, convince them that we were doing our best. Um, and of course, supply was impacted dramatically because in this state, uh, remember for a lot of this, uh, unlike a huge uh, conglomerate like Ratnadeep or something, which has its uh, owns almost entirely its supply chain, we rely a lot on interstate transfer vehicles. Um, and mm. that's exactly what small farmers do. Small farmers are not um, necessarily putting everything into one truck. They're sending us something at the back of a bus. Now, the bus is not running, so that produce yeah. is going to get to us. So, um, so it took definitely a couple of weeks to actually come out of that uh, in terms of steadying the supply that we had. Uh, but I have to give credit that uh, the panic buying actually died down pretty quickly. Um, I know we heard some horrific stories from coming out of the U.S., et cetera. Uh, and I made a bit of a joke about it because in the U.S., they ran out of toilet papers. In India, yeah. it was actually yeast. Yeast was the one thing that the stores didn't seem to have because obviously everybody wanted to bake some bread while they were sitting at home. Yeah. So, um, uh, but I think that that definitely went down pretty rapidly. Um, within the first uh, three, four weeks, we saw uh, almost a leveling off and a calming down. Um, there was a second possible surge of a strict lockdown coming up. We saw a little bit of a surge, but again, we were able to control that. Um, but I must say that um, uh, that at no point did people feel that this was the way to go, that we just had to hold and uh, stay on. So I would say things are pretty much uh, normalized substantially on that front for us. So Nareen, like uh, I know that you said initially people were averse to eating meat, but then now the demand's gone up so much. But um, do you think there's anything that we can do to ensure that supply remains constant? Like that is more streamlined. So, as uh, Lakshmi was, uh, you know, mentioning in my introduction, uh, we are actually a completely integrated uh, uh, company, right? Uh, so, everything uh, from feed milling to uh, broiler farm, you know, breeding, hatcheries, um, you know, growing the, uh, the broiler chicken, slaughtering, retailing, everything is owned in one single company, right? Mm. Within, within the group of companies. So, in that sense, we had, uh, uh, you know, uh, our supply chain is a lot more mature, right? Um, our farmer network is in place. We have regular transports that are picking up the broilers from these designated farms and taking them to the processing plants. And then we have uh, regularly scheduled, uh, you know, cold store um, enabled uh, trucks which are bringing dress um, uh, chicken back into the city into our retail outlets etc so yeah. we, we didn't see a disruption in in that sense of logistical disruption we did not see uh, okay. what what we did see was uh, some confusion at the government level regarding what was essential what was permitted what was uh, allowed to operate or not right so we as a team jumped in very quickly and then uh, uh, took charge of the the, the entire supply chain, um, as in you know getting the permissions and uh, getting all our staff, uh, uh, you know all the all the all the passes and all of that. And within four days of the lockdown, we opened actually uh, out of our forty five outlets, we opened thirteen of them, right? Because there was some panic where some of our staff were, were, wanted to go back to their villages and etc. Uh, we had to communicate a lot to these uh, folk. Uh, we house, uh, anyway, we house all of them. Uh, we provide housing and all of that. So we had to reassure them and uh, we stood by them and they all came back with a vengeance uh, to operate 13 and within the next two weeks, uh, we were operating about uh, 30 stores and a week after that, we went to 43 full scale, right? So in that sense, our supply chain is uh, had... Uh, other issues, we didn't have logistical issues, right? Um, okay. You know, in, in a sense, uh, it was, uh, we had some crazy incidents where farmers start transporting chicken through the villages, you know, uh, actually spread corona. So we had to reach out <laughs> to the farmers because they, they would actually block these trucks 
and uh, uh, typically what happened in small indian villages was they actually barricaded uh, the entire village off right as a mm-hmm. it's a it's a fantastic thing i think they did a fabulous job but so we need to we had to reach out to the panchayats heads and talk to them and say hey this is a regular truck this gets sanitized and you know uh, uh, there's nothing to worry about it we had to reassure them and then the entire supply chain fell in fell in place so uh, we didn't see a major disruption in the supply chain because we owned the entire supply chain but we saw some uh, disruption in operations right uh, in the and, and also um, because there was uh, only uh, i mean slaughterhouse again was not allowed to be operated for some time to come uh, again uh, you know uh, we had to reassure the local authorities and the local population that it's absolutely fine it is part of life now we have to deal with yeah. it right so uh, there was some amount of education to go uh during that time something very interesting happened to us right um one of the things we saw happening was we didn't see a lot of people holding uh, chicken but they did want to store it not okay hold, they wanted to store it right um very interestingly there was uh, one um couple with a especially able child and they reached out to us and uh, Uh, you know told, uh, shared that uh, their child could only eat nandu's chicken and mm-hmm. the child is actually fed through a pipe uh, directly into the stomach right yeah. and um, they had just relocated from abroad the child had actually gotten used to this because we don't use any chemicals and stuff mm-hmm. so luckily we we always have some backup uh, uh, material in the factory uh, where it is all frozen right so we saw a large scale adoption of frozen chicken yeah you know usually people will think that frozen is old but actually it's a great form of preservation especially if you are maintaining the cold chain so yeah we were able to kind of pull together the team somehow somebody got to the factory we opened and prepared a box for the family and then he showed up with a letter from the government saying that he could travel and it was such a wonderful thing that the child that usually ate fresh was now able to um, safely eat frozen so in that sense we saw a large scale adoption of frozen uh, chicken come into play yeah right so some of the very interesting things that are coming out of this this situation is people are learning to live yeah uh, yeah it it's phenomenal to see how we have been able to adjust and modify our behaviors yeah and also the pandemic has brought out as you're saying very unusual behavior also right because we are all survivors at the end of the day uh, and maybe kavita you can take this in terms of uh, i think people have taken a lot to buying locally because there was a lot of issue of shipping you know coming and and also question of trust right like somebody may buy banana chips from the neighborhood auntie i'm i'm seeing in my complex actually a lot of women cooking and you know in the surrounding areas cooking and supplying and stuff so there's a lot of local dependence that has started because of this uh, then buying something branded etc um and uh, now that we are unlocking and we are getting back to quote unquote whatever the new normal is um is there an opportunity to boost a balance of local and uh, uh, global uh, consumption you know uh, you know on one hand it's wonderful to have uh, the frozen option because that's a new discovery for a lot of the people and on the other hand there is a discovery of local foods also so um, what can buyers and sellers do differently is there some new opportunities here uh, kavita maybe you can take that and so, how should we change uh, our behaviors a little bit even as seller even as buyers so i think one thing uh, that definitely we saw across the board and uh, maybe this is definitely i hope it's a lesson that we take away from um, this entire experience uh, i think the general slowing down did increase the level of empathy that people had and the patience that they had and their interest in engaging with what they were doing and when you very clearly put down the fact that these are your only essential services and nothing else really matters because you are now going to live life for 6 ma- weeks without anything other than just your essential it does put a lot of things in perspective for people so 
um you know i know in the first week i had people calling me and saying hey do you store matcha or you know hey do you store truffle oil and we're like no that's not what we do that's not what we've ever done and i'm never likely to do that uh, but i can tell you about this lovely gangabel kura that's growing in the back of my uh, yard and what you can actually do with it so um i think there was a lot of openness to uh, experimenting trying something new um and something that happened with us for the first time uh we struggled as in farming you often do with your crop um and we were struggling with the basic greens like your uh, spinach etc but we had a flourish of tree based uh, spinach um and suddenly we saw people were willing to actually experiment with this because there was such a dearth of fresh greens that you could actually add to your food so people were just so open and willing to experiment and once you start trying with something other than your spinach you just realize that there are so many options in india and things that actually grow locally yeah. um my concern is definitely that this might be a somewhat of a short term lived uh, tendency uh, but as happens with any kind of a phenomena when uh, when a wave like this comes through um a lot of people get carried away uh, half of the way uh, some of them another 25% and then a few all the way to the end so we do hope to see more conversions we do hope to see people understanding that at the end of the day you know that empathy that they showed to their neighborhood auntie who was uh, trying to make uh, money by uh, frying her banana chips um the reality that she was working with the banana chips because that's what was being grown right then and that's what made sense because that's what she had access to that's what she could value add to and as she value added to that it actually meant that she could actually survive on something like that and fundamentally food if you think about it as your essential unless we choose seasonal unless we choose local unless we start to experiment and work with uh, what is available in and around us it's you don't need a pandemic to actually explain it to you but in the long run we actually cannot possibly make the food and the food chain and food supply um, uh, sustainable yeah and i must say you know for years as long as i have known kavita she has always been saying about the importance of seasonality following the seasonality instead of saying i want the same vegetable all year long you know we should eat whatever is available in that season and uh, it's something you you really stand for kavita so thanks for saying that lakshmi um, there's an audience question i think it will okay. fit so what kavita said so and this is a question that i'm sure a lot of people are asking so this question is from vipasha tilak uh, and her question is is conscious buying or conscious products meant only for the elite that's a, a very very valid question and i think this is where some of what happened during covid would be a very interesting phenomena if we actually can take it forward um there are serious challenges with what we do and over the last uh, decade couple of decades uh, there's been a lot of misinformation that has been fed out to uh, natural producers which has led them down a path which has made it very challenging to have authentic safe product uh you know we talk about uh, nutrition versus uh, uh fitness and i always have a challenge with uh, with this because uh it's you know clean eating is not about just being able to eat broccoli it's about being able to understand how the broccoli was grown and whether it's actually good for you after it goes into your system forget about the number of calories it uh, carries so as a result of it the challenge vipasha is definitely the fact that today a lot of the processes that are required we are reverse engineering and we're going back to the basics of what we used to do our grandparents don't know anything other than natural and organic uh, raising of food so um sourcing of ethical produce uh, rearing of ethical produce has become a huge challenge because of the phenomena that we've gone through over the last couple of decades and that uh that includes stories around chicken that i'm sure uh, narend can talk to uh, includes uh, dairy includes produce uh, pretty much across the grain um but my hope is that once the adoption rates increase the access increase once it's viable very viable for farmers and producers to realize that you can do the right thing and still find a market for it and be paid the right amount for that and that's very very critical um you know I, even within the pandemic i had people who were they were getting 10 kilos of vegetables 
a basket for 300 rupees and they were like hey you know since we're buying 50 do you think we can negotiate for 250 and that doesn't work you have to value what you're consuming and this is where i again come back to the whole nutrition and fitness it's not you know you unless we support the farmer and say hey you know what i'm going to take you under my wing and i know it's going to cost a little bit but you doing the right thing is important for me in the long run once we can do that and convince them that there is a market for it hopefully it might take another decade but over this decade once the system set back down again we will get to a place where ethical uh, sourcing and ethical living would not be just for the elite but i'm not going to deny that currently a lot of it has become very expensive and exclusive because there is only a certain customer who's even willing to care for that story and that story and putting that out there and procuring it just has become a challenge uh, from all perspectives. Um, I have a question for uh, Naren and you know before that I just want to say that you know in fact the elite has lost their way in the last few years, I think. Whoever we call the ordinary, they are actually the elite as far as I'm concerned in terms of they know how to eat, they know what grows around them, they know how to go to the backyard, pick something and make something out of it. It's the elite who suddenly say, oh, I can't do without the imported avocado or something like that and uh, messed up our, our eating system instead of following seasonality. You know, So I think there is a lot of learning to be done to go back to actually what our grandparents were doing. I think we'll all be fine if we just get back to that. Um, and you know, Naren, what I want to ask you is, one is, I'm saying we should really remember what they did two generations ago and that was very sustainable. On the other hand, there are a lot of technologies, there are a lot of advances that have come now to move ourselves into the future. Uh, There's a lot of practices we can adopt that were just beyond the reach of our uh, forefathers potentially that we can adopt. And uh, we talked about Insectify, we talked about some of the things that you're doing. Uh, the whole concept of circular economy that basically nothing goes to waste, everything is used. You are really implementing it extremely well in Nandu's kitchen. So, uh, so uh, in Nandu's chicken. So uh, do you mind talking a little bit about it, which makes it to our kitchen anyway? So I'm just giving you a new brand name for your company. So can you talk a little bit about the uh, work that you're doing um, in the circular economy, Naren? Um, that's a wonderful question, uh, Lakshmi. You know, I think uh, before I go there, I just wanted to address, take a minute and address that question uh, regarding, you yeah. know, good produce is always for the elite is equal to more expensive. That's actually a wrong equation, right? So that was one of the first things we wanted to break when we started Nandus. And we went back to the drawing board and said, can we produce good quality meat without any chemicals? We're not organic, but we are not we are chemical free, right? And um, organic has got a different definition to the whole thing. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what organic is. The organic meaning the entire supply chain has to be organic. The grain has to be organic. The soya has to be organic. The land should not have been tilled for 10 years, land has to be certified. You know, Kavita can talk about uh, about that in length. But, um, so we were very cognizant of that fact. And we said, um, we won't shoot for organic, but we will shoot for chemical free at an affordable price that applies to the entire segment or the spectrum of society that is consuming chicken. That is our, that is our you know, purpose. So it took us about eight months to actually go back uh, to the basics and question everything that was being done with regards to growing chicken. So simple cracks, simple discipline and good training and good selection of good farmers and training them and communicating the whole purpose of running a business uh, was, was add, uh, brought about a great change in the farming community that works with us. Right. Uh, farmers inherently are uh, very hardworking and the most underappreciated community in the world, in, uh, you know, <laughs> anywhere in the on the planet. Yeah, right? in the world probably, yeah. So, you know, they all want to do the right thing, but somebody has to guide them and show them the, the, the purpose of what they're doing and put it out to the consumers. So that's exactly what we did. We went back to our farmers who are growing chicken for us we engage them on an integration model business where we take up the entire business risk. 
and they just um, you know um, work with us to grow our chicken so we went back good uh, biosecurity practices good farming practices we trained them on all of that and out came after 8 months of our experimentation out came a product which was free of all chemicals and uh, we we live, uh, stand by that word even today so um to 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 answer that question a good product need not be expensive right uh, the product that we uh, offer at nandu is free of all chemicals and it's not significantly more expensive than what is sold in a uh, in a regular chicken shop where there's absolutely no traceability in terms of where the chicken comes from or how it has grown up so so that's what i wanted to say it's uh, it, it's 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 a function of our discipline uh, it's a function of our commitment to doing the right thing that can actually make food viable Uh, at a good price for the entire society right? it's also volume right uh, yeah. yeah and and we we've, we've cracked that puzzle where we are producing you know close to half a million chicken a month uh, without use of any chemicals or any antibiotics right so it's possible to do but it, you need a shift in the the mindset to do the right thing right so that was uh, like a, uh, you know what i wanted to add to kavita's answer um then coming back to sustainability uh, we have always focused on uh, farming in the right manner we were we are very socially conscious regarding our um, carbon footprint on uh, due to our business on the planet uh, so we were you know, very early on we started adopting uh, solar solar energy in all our breeding farms and in all our growing farms um, because of the nature of these farms being very remote and rural there is no electricity okay there's hardly any electricity rural electricity is is quite difficult to come by so we were using gener- uh, generators and uh, burning a lot of uh, uh, fuel so we wanted to address that so we adopted solar this was about 10 years ago we were the first ones in the industry to go completely solar so when i actually went back to the electricity board and surrendered our connection that guy just fell off the seat he's like why would you come and <laughs> you know surrender your power connection i said i'm sorry you should now so we took that up and we are so glad we did uh, we did that um, yeah, hundreds of liters of diesel per year like for one single farm we were we were consuming close to about uh, 600 to 700 liters of diesel a month and that come came down to 40 liters a month only under emergency situation where we don't have sun india has got plenty of sun right so that was that was one of our sustainability initiatives uh then came biogas we use chicken litter that, that emits methane that's 20 uh, 20 plus uh, times more um, harmful to the planet than carbon dioxide so we captured all the methane from poultry litter started producing biogas and from biogas started producing electricity to run our farms so that was our second initiative right so when i look back now and connect the dots uh, all of what we did with the right intention Uh, led us to what we are doing at nandus today right uh, it was you know our focus on sustainability it, it cannot be business as usual anymore that's what i keep telling everybody it if it is not in your farm doesn't mean that it is not on the planet it is it is there on the planet i can't just throw away stuff outside my compound and expect it to disappear <laughs> right yeah. so we we all have to feel responsible about that and we have been uh, responsible and having done all of that today we see that consumers come back and they want to align with a brand that stands for these principles right um that very sorry we 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 have uh, we do have only like about 10 uh, 12 minutes or so i want to make sure you talk about the insectify you know the thing you're doing okay uh, that really is a future okay brilliant yeah. so uh, as part of these sustainability initiatives one of the things that we also looked at was uh, how can we make poultry production even more sustainable than than the initiatives that we were taking and one of the things that we were doing is um, we use um, soya in production of the poultry feed so poultry feed is generally composed of corn and soya about 20% of all poultry feed is made from uh, you know ingredient is soya and soya is uh, very heavy on the planet it requires a lot of land to grow a lot of water to grow and 80% of all soya grown across the planet is actually used in uh, used as feed for animal production right so that was a nagging uh, question in my mind and uh, for about 5 years i had been researching how could we solve this in a sustainable manner 
and you know i read in an article somewhere that insects are a natural um, you know there there's emerging stories about uh, insect farming and uh, uh, got me very interesting so insect farming is a circular economy come uh, business why i say circular economy because the insects are plentifully available in uh, in our environment they will consume all the organic waste that we are producing and they produce they lay eggs and that hatches into larvae and the larvae will eat all of the organic uh, matter that's produced by our uh, urban cities right what are we doing with that today we are restaurant waste uh, you know household waste we are just throwing them into uh, landfills they leach into the ground pollute the gr- ground water so why not take all of that and grow these insects i call them you know wonderful nature's cleaning machines vacuum cleaners right they are absolutely phenomenal to watch and uh, you know be with uh, because you know they are so much full of life it's so exciting to see them so in 15 days they put on close to about 600 times their body weight okay voracious eaters and then what we do is just before pupation we harvest them and we dry uh, dry them up and then we fee, uh, we we crush it we extract insect oil as well as insect meal and the insect meal will replace soya in the poultry feed so our objective uh, with insectify is to rid a small indian city in the next couple of years of of all of its uh, urban organic pet waste second is try and replace as much uh, soya uh, bean meal in poultry feed and fish meal that is used for uh, making fish feed so fish meal production is extremely dangerous and it's disastrous to our coastal uh, you know coastal fisheries right and everything is being fished out and everything is being dried and uh, powdered and added into fish feed so we will replace that so that's the whole objective of insectify where we are you know and as a as as a as a matter of fact we can produce in one acre of insect farming we can produce 64 hectares of what can be produced using soya using 99% less water mm. yeah so narin like actually somebody in the audience had asked a question on you know what we can actually do with our waste so you given like quite a detailed yeah. uh, answer to that yeah. so just to add to that i have a kamba at home we don't throw anything out of my my house all of the kitchen waste goes into a kamba compostable kamba uh it's it's uh, uh, there's a, da- a company called daily dump and they make daily these kamba yeah. yeah right beautiful all we have to do is put these the put the organic wet waste in the uh, in the kamba and just open the, uh, the top a little bit and nature will do the rest they come and lay eggs those will hatch fall into the fe- uh, into the organic matter and at the end of the day you have a whole pot of insects that you can just throw it out into the garden and whatever is left out from the organic matter is organic manure yeah yeah, yeah. great uh, so we are at the last 7 minutes of it so i want to make sure i ask each of you you know kavita and uh, narin a wrap up question in terms of uh, uh, you know one of the things that's emerging which uh, kavita you talked about at the beginning is more collaborations unusual collaborations and cooperatives and uh, because we are in a situation that no one knows how to move forward it's not like there is somebody to learn from we are all dealing with new situations so maybe each of you can talk a little bit about what are the kind of collaborations that you think are um, happening in your areas and you would like to see and since we are talking to uh, all the small and medium uh entrepreneurs what kind of collaboration should they think of uh, having so your thoughts on that would be really great so um my dream project uh, let's see which uh, i think with covid uh, is probably uh, closer to fruition um i think um, for me the biggest problem is very clearly uh, the fact that the the difference in what is actually being produced versus what is being consumed um and that is something that really does have to be addressed uh, hopefully through education the consumer can get a little more conscious but farming is a, an art it's not a science it will never be exact um so collaboration where uh, you know what i would love to see going forward is 
um, an exchange of sorts where uh, producers come in as well as maybe communities come in. So you actually completely avoid the middleman uh, and they can connect with each other so that fresh produce can find a home for itself as quickly as it possibly can. Um, and a, a part of that exchange is actually something where creative cooks like I can come in and figure out, okay, so this is what is left, this is what people don't want. Um, it has exactly three more days to actually uh, become productive in some way or the other. And use something, you know, out of our little arsenal and produce the heck out of it and value-added products and then uh, have it accessible for a longer time. So whether that's by fermenting, the pickling, solar drying, um, or any of those stuff. And if, if nothing else, as the name referred to it, you know, at least make sure that it goes back to a farm and gets composted and goes back to the soil in one way or the other. So trying to see that uh, completion uh, from, uh, from source to um, selling, it would be a really nice uh, way to direction to forward. Yeah. Uh, Narain, I know you work with a lot of small farmers. So what are your insights into it? Um, I, I think one of the most interesting things that has come out of, uh, come out of this uh, pandemic situation is it has basically taught us how to quickly collaborate with the society at large, right? Uh, we have always collaborated with a lot of farmers. Uh, today, we are there about close to about 250 farmers across South India who uh, who grow chicken for us. It's been an amazing collaboration with us. In fact, uh, you know, um, we have times when our farmers who are growing chicken are spend, uh, spend half a day at our outlets and get to meet the customers who are actually consuming what they are growing. Right? It brings them closer. It, it values them. So we collaborate very closely with the farmers, one. Second, um, in uh, due to COVID, our collaboration with online marketplaces have, have uh, you know, actually accelerated uh, enormously, right? Uh, because they became our delivery partners and we became their only source of business because restaurants were all now shut, right? Yeah. So there was a very symbiotic re relationship that emerged. Um, then collaboration with uh, a lot of entrepreneurs. Like we work with an I, another IoT company uh, to IoT enable and monitor the insect farm. Wow. Right. Uh, all of the data. So we, we, are, we are breeding and we are producing close to about 3 million eggs a day. Um, and uh, the, the perfect uh, environment for them to lay those eggs have to be created. And that was possible only because of our collaboration with a company that's doing IoT. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. All of the, the humidity, temperature. So collaboration is happening all over. It is, you know, it, it, no one industry is exempted from this or that, right? So we're always looking for collaboration. We are collaborating with the farmers. We are collaborating with, uh, you know, even the apartment communities. Now they want exclusive uh, chicken outlets to be uh, located in large apartment communities. Yes. So, yeah. 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 So you don't have to actually go anywhere, and the chicken is uh, right at the doorstep, which is completely, uh, you know, traceable. So it's been phenomenal. You know, we have found great opportunities to collaborate during this time. Great. I want to, uh, you know, first of all, thank both uh, uh, Kavita and Narin for bringing. I just want to summarize two things that have come up. One is Kavita talking about. The difference between being healthy and being fit you know it's health is a different path to take and also the importance of seasonality these were really really uh, very very unique insights and then narain about um you know how to cater uh, you know the source i mean how to cater so that the source is known and uh, all the great work you're doing to do that really is commendable. I'd love for Tina to actually wrap up and maybe Tina, you can talk for a minute or so about one of the most important thing for the small entrepreneur is the financing piece of it. Maybe you can shed a little bit of light on that and then wrap up the session. Yeah. Thanks, Lakshmi. Uh, just quickly, I know like our honorable uh, finance minister announced a lot of schemes that would um, help the sector, like for setting up agriculture infrastructure, um, marine and Indian fisheries um, for animal husbandry. Then even uh, subsidies were have been announced, like to ensure that stock would move from surplus markets to deficient markets, which is something that we've been talking about, like to ensure that you know that the farmers get the right price for their product and at the right time. 
So these were some of the things that uh, our Honorable Finance Minister announced. Aside from that, I must say that um, even the Reserve Bank emphasizes a lot on uh, ensuring that support is given to the sector, like through banks. The banks have to compulsorily lend for, um, a, a portion of their credit uh, with emphasis on agriculture. So and that goes through multiple layers, like banks, NPFCs, so that this, the loans reach the last mile uh, consumer, and in, in this case, the farmers. Um, so that was just like quickly wrapping up on what uh, schemes are available for uh, farmers and anyone in the agriculture sector. Um, just to close off, um, I'm still on behalf of everyone at Inc. and Mutur Fincorp and all of our mentors, we're inviting um, anyone who's running a small business to ask whatever questions you may have related to your business. Visit our website, www.restartindia.in, post your questions and we'll be more than happy to get back to you. All right. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you. Namaste. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.